Hey there, folks. If you're listening to this story independently, I just want to let you know, if you have also listened to the two stories, I found out why my father doesn't allow smoking in the house, and I finally found out what was behind that piece of wood in my parents' kitchen. If you've listened to those, this is the third, the follow-up final version for those stories. So, hope you enjoy. Don't forget to like, subscribe, be all that. Let's start this story. What the hell are you talking about, Bill? My father asked, confused, standing in the doorway of the sunroom, smoking a cigarette. Dad, Dad, I know it sounds crazy, but there really was a demon in the basement, and it kidnapped Melinda. I said, totally freaking out, pacing back and forth and chain-smoking. You don't know that for sure, son, my mom said dismissively, sitting on the couch. Maybe she just went to the store. I put out my cigarette, lit another one, and responded. Mom, there are three claw marks on her pillow, just like the one from the basement. Our bedroom is destroyed and Melinda is gone. Besides, I had the car and the nearest store is three miles away. Melinda likes to keep in shape, but she's not going to walk three miles and back just for a veggie burger. I gotta find her. If what you say is true, then how do you suppose to do that, Bill? My father asked. Oh, it's true. It's damn true, I said. Well, I didn't really say that. That's my Kurt Angel impersonation from back in the day. You know who Kurt Angel is, right? Olympic gold medalist, current WWE superstar. Anyway, sorry about that. Now, I didn't actually say damn to my father. You see, even though I'm grown, I still don't curse in front of my parents. It's a respect thing. Plus, my father would whoop my ass. Now, I know what you're thinking. Damn is not a curse word. Well, according to my parents, it is. Anyway, believe me, Dad, it's true. And I'm not really sure how I'm going to find her. But I'm going to find her. I actually replied. My mom then sat up quickly and said, If Melinda has her phone, you could do that thing that you did when I left my phone at the grocery store. You told me where it was. You're right, I said excitedly. Find my phone. Yeah, yeah, l let me try that. I pulled my phone out of my pocket. It was at 3%. Anyone with an iPhone knows that using the flashlight for long periods of time will drain the hell out of your battery. Anyway, I opened the phone, hit the Find My Phone app, selected Melinda's phone, and then a little icon started spinning. After a few seconds, the app showed me where it was. And you're not going to believe it. It was in the same place we were, at our house. I put my cigarette out hastily, put my phone in my pocket, and ran upstairs, following the pinging sound into our bedroom. It was coming from under the bed. I looked, and there it was. Well, so much for that idea, I thought, reaching under the bed, grabbing the phone, and turning off the annoying pinging sound. Now, before you say that I'm lying, which I know you will, let me tell you something first. Now, I have no idea on God's green earth how what happened next actually happened, but it did. As I was standing there holding Melinda's phone in my left hand, my phone, which was in my pocket, started to play Just You and I. You know, my ringtone for when Melinda calls me, remember? Now, like I said, I have no idea how that would even be possible. You don't have to believe me, and I'm sure most of you don't, but I don't care. I know for a fact that really happened. Anyway, I quickly reached into my pocket with my right hand, grabbed my phone, took it out of my pocket, and held it in my hand, and looked at it. Melinda, the screen read. What the fuck? I thought, turning my head to the left and staring at Melinda's phone as the song played on. I then nervously answered my phone. I didn't even say hello, I just held it to my ear. What I heard coming out of that speaker still haunts me to this day. I've developed night terrors because of it. 
I randomly hear it in my dreams, even the good ones, and the next thing I know, I'm waking up screaming my brains out. It was that terrifying. What did you hear? You ask. Well, I heard desperate screams of anguish and pain from men, women, and children mixed together with sounds of flames crackling, babies crying, the loud sound of metal machinery clanking together, and deep demonic laughter all at the same time. Oh shit moment number 10. I attempted to pull the phone away from my ear, but as I did, I felt the skin of my ear start to tear and felt blood flowing down my neck. The pain was excruciating. I screamed out in agony. It was like the phone was glued to my ear. I put the phone back to my ear, sucking up the pain and having no choice but to listen, cringing every single second. Suddenly, like a ghostly EVP, I heard a voice. It was a voice I recognized. It was Melinda's voice. Bill, help, it said. Melinda, I screamed into the phone. Everything went silent. The pain subsided at that point. After a second or so, I heard another familiar voice. She is more beautiful in person. I'm going to have fun with her. So much fun. The demon said wickedly. She wasn't part of the deal. I screamed into the phone. Oh, did you forget already? You said I could have anything. He replied arrogantly. No, I did not. I said you could have anything. Thing. Two words, not one, I quickly shot back. Then my inner geek came out. I continued by saying, The fact that humans, male or female, are living beings rather than inanimate objects means they are not things. Now give her back, I screamed. Oh, very clever. So, Bill. May I call you Bill? So, if you want her, come and get her. Twelve o'clock, midnight, human time, where we first met. Come alone, or I'll kill her right in front of you, just to watch you squirm. <laughs> the demon instructed, followed by echoing demonic laughter in the background. Don't you hurt her, I screamed. I then heard the sound of a dial tone, which does not happen on cell phones. The dial tone then stopped. I stood there, afraid to remove the phone from my ear. After a few seconds, I tried and it moved away like normal. What the hell? I said to myself. I fumbled around, found Melinda's charger, plugged in my phone, and sat it on her nightstand. After standing up her lamp, I then realized that my ear was still bleeding. I put Melinda's phone in my left front pocket, turned around, and quickly made my way to the bedroom door. I opened the door, and my mother was standing there. She scared the crap out of me. Oh, my God, Bill, you're bleeding. What happened, son? She asked, concerned. It's nothing, Mom. I'll be fine, I replied, moving past her on the way to the bathroom. I got to the bathroom, shut the door, locked it, and looked at myself in the mirror. The blood had caked to the side of my neck and covered the right shoulder of my T-shirt. I quickly took the shirt off. I grabbed a washcloth from out of the drawer wet it and wiped my neck off and held it to my ear. Oh shit moment number 11. I pulled the cloth away after a minute or so and looked at it. There was no blood on the cloth. What the... I said to myself. I then picked up my shirt and there was no blood on it either. I just stood there confused, staring at my ear in the mirror thinking, 
I know I felt the skin tear, but there's no scars. I know I felt it bleeding, but there's no blood. I know there was blood. I saw it. My mother even saw it. What the hell's going on? Suddenly, I heard a loud pounding on the bathroom door and heard the doorknob jiggle quickly. Bill, Bill, are, are you all right, son? I heard my father yell. Open this door, right now. I took a deep breath, exhaled, and opened the door. See, Dad, I'm fine. Nothing to worry about. I said, putting my shirt back on. Your mother said you were bleeding. He said, concerned, no blood. See, I'm fine. I responded, turning my head so he could see my ear, showing him the washcloth and my shoulder, but we do need to talk. We all went back to the sunroom. I lit another cigarette, and so did my father. I stood in front of the TV and proceeded to tell them about the phone call. My mom just looked at me like a deer in the headlights. My father, however, reverted back to his military days and took a fighting stance. Well, let's go get her, son, he said aggressively. No, Dad, we can't. I have to go alone or he'll kill her. I said sharply, saying no to my father is like having a death wish. I knew it, but I didn't have a choice. He cut me the most intense Gibbs stare that I had ever seen. There was a few seconds of silence. My father then broke the silence by saying, You're a man now, Bill. I have to remember that. Go. Handle your business, son. Thanks, Dad. I responded. It was about 5.30 in the afternoon at that point. I still had six and a half hours until it was time to meet. I gotta go, guys. I'll be back with Melinda, I said, putting out my cigarette and running upstairs. Good luck, son, my father said. Be careful, Bill. I love you, my mom said. Love you too, mom, I replied, running up the stairs and into our bedroom. I grabbed my phone from off the nightstand, ran back downstairs, grabbed another pack of smokes from out of the freezer, then made my way to the front door. I opened the door and quickly ran to my car. I got to my car, got in, and just sat there, thinking to myself, after lighting another cigarette, I'm getting ready to fight a demon. Now we'll see if what I learned in high school actually works. I'm going to need more than a screwdriver this time. Anyway, I think it's time that I tell you a little bit more about myself. Now, if you've been reading my posts, you probably think I'm in my 20s or maybe 30s. And all I have to say to that is, I wish. You see, I just celebrated my 48th birthday. Yes, I'm that old. Melinda is five years younger than me. Now, being born in 1974 means I grew up right in the middle of the heavy metal explosion that happened in the early 80s. The first time I heard quiet riots, come on, feel the noise, I was blown away. I've been completely hooked from that moment. I even taught myself how to play guitar. Anyway, anyone who grew up listening to metal knows that there was a lot of controversy around that style of music. Groups like the PMRC and various religious groups said that the music was derived from worshipping Satan and that the music evokes demons and conjures spirits. I didn't care about any of that. I just liked the songs. So, for my senior term paper, I decided that my topic would be demons just to get a reaction of all the non-metalheads in my English class and the teacher. We had to read it in front of the whole class, at least at my school we did. I got a 94, in case you're wondering. Now, I learned a lot of information about demons. Some of it you may already know, but I'm going to tell you anyway. One of the things I learned is that demons do not like smoke and will flee anywhere where smoke is present. Another thing I learned is that burning sage will make them flee as well, among many other things. I decided to use this to my advantage. Now, given the fact that I'm the production manager of the Chestertown Theater, 
No, it's not a movie theater. It's an actual theater. We put on plays. What's a play? Are you kidding me right now? Some of the best movies out there started out as plays or we turned into them. You know, like Grease, most of the Medea movies, Cats, well, they never turned Cats into a movie. Not that I know of anyway, but they should. Anyway, even Green Day's American Idiot was on Broadway. What's Broadway? Man, do I have to explain it? I got a story to tell. Now, like I said, I'm the production manager for the Chestertown Theater, which means I have full access to the smoke machines. We sometimes use them in our play productions. So that part was covered. Now, where to get sage? The only place that I could think of was the produce department at, well, everyone's creepy grocery store, Barnaby's. So I decided to go there first. I walked in and grabbed all the sage that was on the shelf. I knew it wasn't the type of sage commonly used for cleansing here in the good old U.S. of A., but they swear by it in Europe. I figured it can't hurt, so why not? I asked my buddy Zeke, he's a huge Suicidal Tendencies fan, if there was any more in the back. He said no. I thanked him, then took what little bit of sage I had, hoping it was enough, up to the register and paid for it. I was just about to walk out of the door when Bill, the maintenance guy, we have the same name, anyway, he came running out of the basement screaming something about a boiler blowing up. I burst through the door, ran to my car, and got the hell out of there as fast as I could. The whole building exploded soon after. I would have turned around to help, but I had to prepare myself for battle. I then went to the theater. Eric, the props guy, just looked at me funny when I told him I needed a smoke machine. Don't ask, I said. Wasn't going to, he replied. He turned around, grabbed one of the machines, as well as the remote and the battery, then handed them to me. You see, all of our smoke machines are remote controlled and battery operated, not that you care. Anyway, sign here, he instructed, and handed me a clipboard form from off the wall. You break it, you buy it, he said, smiling. I signed it out, thanked him, and walked back to my car. I put the machine and the accessories in the back seat, got in, and drove to my parents' house. Well, not quite. On the way, I stopped off at the local church. The parking lot was completely empty. I parked in the spot nearest to the door. I grabbed a half-drank bottle of Deer Park spring water off the floorboard of my car, opened the door, dumped it out, and ran inside, bottle in hand. Now, what I did next, some of you may not agree with and blast me for it, but I needed all the help I could get. I ran in and immediately came across a beautifully crafted stoop. You know, the thing that the holy water is kept in. Anyway, I looked around quickly to see if anyone was watching. No one was. I then submerged the bottle into the water for about five seconds to gather as much of it as I possibly could in that short amount of time. I got about half a bottle. I put the cap on, put it in my front coat pocket. I was still wearing it, by the way, then ran out of the church. Lord, please forgive me. I asked the man upstairs, or woman, if that's what you believe. Anyway, I tossed the bottle on my passenger seat, lit another smoke, and then drove to my parents' house. If you haven't noticed, I smoke like a chimney. Anyway, it was about 10 o'clock at that point. Now, I know you're thinking it took four and a half hours to do that little bit of stuff. Well, as I said earlier, the boiler blew up at Barnaby's, and since the store is located in the center of town, and this town only has one main road, the road was closed off for hours, only letting a few cars through at a time. The theater is on the west side of the store, and the church is on the east side of the store, and my parents' house is right down the street west of it. So I had to sit in miles of traffic for about an hour and a half twice. Something is always going on at that place. I mean, you should hear all the stories about Barnabas. Damn, I'm doing it again, telling you useless information 
that has nothing to do with the story. I'm surprised you're still reading this, given the fact of how annoying it is. Now, where was I? Oh, yeah. I sat in the car in my parents' driveway for the next hour and 45 minutes, trying to devise a plan. My mind was racing with all kinds of different things I could do. As the time drew near, I finally said, Screw it. Let's just see what happens. I grabbed the sage, the bottle of water, my lighter, and the keys, then got out of the car. I put the bottle of water in my left back pocket and put the sage and lighter in my left front pocket. I then opened the back door, grabbed the smoke machine, as well as the accessories, and proceeded to the front door. I just walked in, as I didn't lock it before. The house had the same feeling as before, only this time it was cold, really cold, colder than it was outside. I could see my own breath. It was that cold. Anyway, I pulled out my phone from my pocket and turned the flashlight on. It was at about 54%, by the way. I then shined the light around the room and made my way to the kitchen, then over to the basement entrance. I set the smoke machine on the floor, facing into the basement, and attached the battery. Mere seconds after attaching the battery, I heard the sound of a single splash of water coming from the basement, which scared the shit out of me. I jumped. The water pipes must be dripping a little, I thought, but if that was true, I would have heard another splash seconds later, and I didn't. What the hell, I muttered to myself. I then looked at my phone. It was two minutes to midnight. Oh, I love that song, Iron Maiden Rocks. Anyway, I thought to myself, it's showtime. I'm going to get Melinda back and take care of this demon once and for all. I was so hyped, I didn't take the safe way into the basement this time, no. I crossed myself, said a little prayer, stepped back a few steps, and took a running jump over the smoke machine, blindly through the air and into the darkness. Well, not really blindly. I had my phone in my hand with the flashlight on. Oh shit moment number 12. My left foot landed on a hard piece of the broken step, which jammed my knee up pretty good. I leaned over, grabbing my knee, and screamed out in pain. Son of a gun! I screamed, but the pain would have to wait. Suck it up and deal with it, I told myself. The love of your life is depending on you. I gritted my teeth, took a deep breath, exhaled, then stood up. I looked at my phone. It was 12 o'clock midnight. I stood there, expecting the demon to come in with a grand entrance. But he didn't. After a few seconds, I waved my light around. I saw the mattress lying on the ground and the frame lying under the opening on top of the pieces of broken steps. I screamed out, I'm here! Where are you, you little bastard? No response. I screamed those words again. Still, no response. I then shined my light into the same corner that I saw Melinda standing naked before, and there she was again. This time she was fully dressed in jeans and her favorite pioneer woman scoop neck blouse. Her hands appeared to be tied behind her back with what I couldn't see, and her legs were zip tied together at the ankles. Where the demon got zip ties, I have no idea, but he was a demon, so... Melinda! I screamed, then took a step toward her, but stopped. I didn't fall for it the first time. I'm not falling for it now, I said, as I pulled the sage and the lighter out of my pocket. I lit the sage and put the lighter back in my pocket. The smoke then began filling the air. I held it out in front of me, waving my hand back and forth through the smoke. Give her back, demon, I said as I stepped towards Melinda. What the hell are you doing, Bill? My God, that shit stinks, Melinda said. It's really you? I said excitedly, putting out the sage and quickly going to Melinda. Who the hell else would it be? 
Get me the hell out of here, Bill, she said. I bent down on one knee, shined my light on the zip ties, and began pulling on them as hard as I could. Damn it, Bill, that hurts. Cut them, Belinda yelled. I stood up quickly and patted my pockets, only to realize I left my box cutter in the car. Suddenly, Melinda screamed, Behind you! Bill! Look out! Oh shit moment number 13. I turned around quickly just as the demon grabbed me by the throat, pushing me back against the wall and forcing my head upwards. My phone falling from my hand, landing face down, its flashlight shining up into the basement, dimly lighting it up. I struggled to breathe. Oh, isn't this sweet? You came back to save your little girlfriend. Well, love does make you do stupid things. He said in that same demonic voice. Let her go, I said, struggling to get the words out. I felt myself losing consciousness, but still had the frame of mind to reach into my front pocket and pull out the remote control. I fumbled with the buttons, unable to see what I was doing until the smoke machine began to start pouring out smoke into the basement. The demon shrieked, let go of my throat, stepped back, and waved its hands in front of its face. For some reason, the smoke didn't bother Melinda or I. Anyway, I had him on the ropes. It was now time to finish him. I quickly grabbed the bottle out of my pocket opened it and tossed some at the demon, screaming, let her go. The water hit the demon diagonally across the face. He shrieked. Its skin began to bubble like boiling water as flames shot outward from his head. Its skin then began to slide off of its head, falling to the floor in a smoldering mess, exposing a black burnt skull underneath. He shrieked again, raising its arm to grab me. I swung the bottle vertically through the air, the water hitting the demon's fingers at the second knuckle. His hands burst into flames, his fingers falling away. The demon then fell to the floor, twitching, shaking, and shrieking. Let her go! I screamed and tossed more holy water on its body. It had the same effect. The smoke was becoming so thick that I could barely see. The demon shriek, the most piercing shriek I ever heard, and fell back, lying motionless on the floor. I then threw the whole bottle at his body, hitting him on what would have been his growing area. Bill! I heard Melinda scream as she came running over to me. We closed our eyes and hugged each other tighter than ever before. After about 30 seconds, we released each other. Let's get the hell out of here, I said, using the remote to turn off the smoke machine. I grabbed Melinda's hand, walked over to my phone, picked it up, and used it to find the bed frame. I stood it up against the wall, just like before. Melinda went first, then me. As I was climbing over the smoke machine, I looked back into the basement I was shocked at what I saw. I completely forgot about them. Melinda, look, I said, lightly grabbing her by the arm. She turned and then gasped. Oh shit moment number 14. In the smoke appeared one, then two, then a whole slew of those creatures. But these creatures were different. They all had a yellowish glow to them. They gathered around the body of the demon on the floor. Now, I thought the demon was dead, but I was wrong. The demon sat up quickly and began to continuously shriek. All the creatures then extended their arms and began ripping handfuls of pieces off of the demon's body. Slow at first, then quickly growing into a wild frenzy. As they did, the pieces would disintegrate in their hands and fall to a heaping pile of ash on the floor. Out of the corner of my eye in the corner where Melinda was standing earlier, I could have sworn I saw a figure standing there. It looked just like Father Thomas, the priest that died which caused the church to shut down its recovery program. 
I only know this from having seen a picture of him when Melinda and I were doing our research, and he was smiling. As the smoke began to clear, the creatures began to disappear, as well as the Father Thomas figure. They were soon gone, and so was the demon, all except a huge pile of ash that was on the floor, which burst into flames soon after and quickly died out. Then it hit me. The creatures that took us back to the mental hospital were patients that died as a result of the torture they had endured there. These creatures must have been victims that the demon had killed during the exorcisms. He must have killed Father Thomas too, I thought. I quickly stood up, grabbed the smoke machine, and held it under my left arm. I then put my arm around Melinda's shoulder, and we walked out of the house together, leaving the opening exposed. We got into the car, I put the smoke machine in the back seat, and we drove home. My parents were still awake. They greeted us with huge hugs. My parents then retired to their bedroom. Melinda went to take a shower, and I went to our bedroom and got changed for bed. Melinda returned from the bathroom, put on a nightgown, and climbed into bed. I held her in my arms with her head on my chest. I was happy to have her back. We soon fell asleep. The next morning, Melinda and I returned the smoke machine to the theater, then stopped off at Chelsea's and had some breakfast. As we ate, we talked about what happened. We came to the conclusion that even though the creatures were scary, they didn't actually hurt us, so there was nothing really to be scared of. We decided to move into my parents and let my parents have our house which they agreed to as well. We moved the contents of our bedroom into the house and started staying there since that night. Over time, we furnished the house with furniture and appliances that we got at the local Goodwill. We hired Bob, the owner of the local hardware store, to put a door in the opening of the basement, build the steps leading down into it, and installed an overhead light as well as frame it, insulate it, and drywall the entire basement, and then paint it white. He did it for free in exchange for a lifetime free pass into the theater. Thanks, Bob. We now use the basement as a workout room, with all of Melinda's workout equipment down there. We decided to start smoking in the house again, since, as I said before, there was really nothing to be afraid of. Occasionally, when we blow out the smoke, we'll see a hand or an arm, maybe a face in the smoke. We just say hi and wave to them. Everything was going great until today. Melinda and I had just finished a little workout session in the basement. I let her go first up the stairs and I followed. I got to the doorway, reached out my hand, and turned off the light. Final oh shit moment. As the light went out, I heard a single drip of water hit the floor, just like last time. Only this time, I heard another, then another. It scared the shit out of me. I turned to look into the darkness. What the hell? I said, quickly turning the light back on. What's the matter, Bill? Melinda said. I didn't answer her. I looked into the basement and sighed a huge sigh of relief when I saw that Melinda's Deer Park water bottle that was sitting on top of the treadmill had fell over and its contents were dripping onto the floor. I smiled as I turned the light off. Turning back to Melinda, I said, It's nothing, babe, as I shut the basement door. I'll clean it up later. One thing that still bothers me, though, what caused that single drop of water in the first place?